he pushed me down and wouldn't stop and I screamed and cried and I was like please stop please don't do this. Hello my name is Nita and this is my story of how I became a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. I grew up in London and moved out of the city when I was eight. We started hanging out in the park at eight years old and because I had a twin, we always had each other. So I think we got more freedom to go out. We made friends with some other kids at the local park, Charlie and Drew. Charlie was our age and Drew was older. He was about 14 when we turned nine. And we'd go and build bases and play hide and seek and all those silly games you play as a child. But very slowly, Drew would start bringing in sort of sexual things, themes, um, to the games. I remember the first time we were playing dares. Charlie spun the bottle and it landed on me and he shouted, I dare you to Drew. And I didn't know what the word meant. I looked at my twin to see if she knew. And before I knew it, he jumped on top of me, pushed me down and pushed my skirt up. Gradually, that turned into full on sexual favors. My whole body was frozen. I couldn't move and I couldn't breathe. I mean, my sister, we never said it verbally, but it's like we agreed silently not to tell anyone. I remember going home that day and we just carried on like it was a normal day. Mum asked, how was the park? We said, yeah, it was good and just back to normal. I think as a child, you're so resilient and it was just, we just shut it out. We continued to hang out with Drew and Charlie. So we'd started martial arts and we had to keep our weight down for that. And Charlie had ADHD, so he was prescribed Ritalin, which is a stimulant close to speed, close to amphetamine and makes you not hungry. So I started taking that from him age nine to lose weight for sport. Drew, who was 15 by this point and we're nine, had brought his friend into the mix. We'd be made to sort of sit on their laps while they touched us. They put our hands on their private parts and it was just really uncomfortable. I didn't know how to stop it, but I felt like I'd be in trouble if I asked to have grown up. Over the next year or so, the sexual became more and more severe. There was one incident where Drew had us, one each, he took his turns with me and my sister and made us sort of imitate and it didn't go in, but it was naked, skin on skin, touching. And that was really scared. And that was underneath a sheet on top of the garages. And two adults walked past and saw the sheet going up and down. And they just laughed. They didn't try and help me. They just laughed. There was another incident. We went swimming and they'd just been horrible the whole time, making us do sexual favours in the pool. And there was like a forest next to the swimming pool and hang out there for an hour until my mum could pick us up. Drew and his friend, who was his age, they just started demanding sexual favours and they said that we couldn't go with them unless we said We ran out of the woods and we called mum. We asked to be picked up. And mum said, sort of, why, what's gone on? And I said, they said they can't, we can't hang out with them unless we said I just said it that fast. And my heart was pounding 100 miles an hour. And my mum, she answered on the phone, like, what? What did you just say? And I said, oh no, nothing, don't worry. And then she never followed through on it. That sort of made me think it was my fault or I couldn't tell anyone about it. And um, eventually there was one big incident about two weeks before my 11th birthday. It was in the summer, summer holidays. So I'd gone to pick up Ritalin, the medication I was using for weight loss from Charlie, but it was a sort of an ambush. Drew was there, his friend was there. They took me to the back of the park, started trying to make me kiss him and then ended up on top of me, ended up raping me. I managed to leave eventually, and I never went back out to them after that. I never went back to the park. I thought that was enough, that was the breaking point. And all of this had happened to my sister as well. I remember I was covered in blood, so I got home and I threw my clothes away and jumped in the bath with all my clothes on. But I felt dirty and ashamed and I didn't want to tell anyone. I overdosed that night, I just thought, I'm pregnant, what do I do? So I took every pill I could find in the house, and this is at 10 years old. I just felt like there was something wrong with me. And with the judo and jujitsu, the sport, I was so top game, like top level. They were telling me I was gonna be in the Olympics if I stayed working this hard. I thought I didn't wanna let people down. I thought sort of everyone goes through that because they had other victims that we'd meet. So it would happen to other girls. So we all thought it was normal. And when I had tried to tell when I, an older friend, she was 15 and I was, 12 and she asked have you have i done something with a boy and i said yeah um drew was only 14 though and she's like Ugh, that that means you were nine years old that's disgusting so i thought it was my fault i started turning to alcohol and i was trying to find 
self-harm and bulimia started then as well to just deal with it to escape and I really spent nearly all of my teen years I'd say from 12 to 17 suicidally depressed running away a lot arguing with everybody with my parents and my family and teachers and the police and getting arrested a lot because my behavior I just couldn't control it I just and I didn't understand that it was because of the I just thought there's something wrong with me I started trying to clean my life up so I got a job as a lifeguard I was off not hanging out with anyone I never went back to the estate where all my friends or all my drug friends had been I just traded my addiction for eating disorder so I started my anorexia I got really bad I was eating really low calories I'm not going to say the numbers because I don't want to trigger anyone I eventually met a boyfriend my first proper boyfriend at work and it was like an escape from sort of my dad being angry at me for losing loads of weight and it was an escape from the pain at home because there was a lot of love but also a lot of pain in that house. I started staying with this boyfriend at first he was really nice by me presents, talked to me like really sweet but I wasn't ready to have sex yet because of the he was 30 and I was 17 and I'd kiss and cuddle do a bit of you know place like foreplay but then I'd stop I couldn't go in and usually he'd stop, but this other, this third time we'd had a little bit to drink. He wasn't drunk, but I think he was using it as an excuse. And he pushed me down and wouldn't stop. And I screamed and cried and I was like, please stop, please don't do this. And I remember being told when you first have, just think it'll be over in a minute, it'll be over in a minute, because it's very painful for a lot of women. So I just cried and it silently, uh, I could call the police now and get swabbed and get prosecution. But then I thought of all the anger and pain and arguments that went, my family went through last time with Drew and his friends. So I thought there's no way I can put my family through that again. So I cleaned myself up, put on a brave face and went back into the room and kissed and cuddled and just hung out and um, went to work the next day as if nothing had happened. I started becoming withdrawn after that though and then he'd sort of make me have and the arguments started, the control started, and like he wouldn't let me have my phone or talk to my friends. He eventually cut me off from all my friends and even my family. He locked me in a room for five days once. He'd starve me and make me have sex with his friends, which I found out later he'd taken money for. But when that happens so many times, it makes you feel like your body's just a body to be used and, a and it doesn't matter. And I think my soul, my head is somewhere else. This body is just a vessel that I need to experience life. So the stopped hurting after a while. And my bulimia got super bad, so bad that I lost all movement in the bottom of my leg because of vitamin deficiency from constantly purging. And he started being horrible to me, you know, he started beating me up sometimes. I remember saying to myself, if he says one bad thing to me, I'm not going back. I've got all my stuff. I don't need to go back there. If he says one bad thing, first thing he said coming up to me, you look like, you look disgusting. You're so ugly. And I just ignored him. I didn't even fight back. I just ignored him and I never went around there again. And eventually, you know, he came back with, oh, I'm sorry. I love you. You know, we're crazy, but we're together. I just ignored him. And he ended up committing a couple of years ago so I guess karma you know and I don't know how to feel about that um, because obviously he really hurt me but it's still a life and life's so precious and we should all be grateful for it you know so it's still sad after being trafficked after that stopped I never really got any official help but I ended up reading um, Fragile by Nikki Graham who sadly passed away now and it's a book about her story with anorexia and I just thought I could do that I could write a book so I started writing just got everything out and it was really helpful and really therapeutic but also sad it taught me a lot about myself because it just got everything out on paper and in the open and I wrote it as a story and I published that when I was 19 and it sold quite a few and everyone that read it said it was really helpful I had parents of children coming up to me saying hey you know my kid's struggling with behavioral issues do you think something's happened I think when a kid suddenly starts misbehaving a kid that's been good as gold and they suddenly start misbehaving something's happened to them to make that happen and it might not always be sexually 
but it's really important to ask them and I think with children you really have to ask the right questions because they're not able to verbalize what they've been through so you do it with small questions even if something happened years ago did something happen years ago anything has anyone ever made you feel uncomfortable and touch you and then they could go into that they might go into remembering because they won't know themselves the only way and the best way to get back at your abusers is to go and live a good life a successful happy positive life and love and live and laugh sorry to be cheesy but go and enjoy and experience everything in spite of what they did and if you can channel that to teach others how to deal with it that's even better because you're passing it on and spreading sort of positivity and release um through people's struggles i want to share my story so that other victims of know that it's okay and it's not their fault. I think signs people should look out for um, that might suggest is behavioural changes, especially in children. Like, are they suddenly misbehaving when they're usually really good? Are they suddenly withdrawing from work, not wanting to hang out with friends, being sort of isolated on their own, acting dramatically and crying and shouting and screaming at really small sort of triggers? You have to look at everyone like they could hurt your kids so that it wouldn't happen to them. And I think we have to teach our kids how to verbalise it, say, um, for example, telling your kids, hey, that's your private area, no one's allowed to touch that. If someone touches that, you tell mummy or daddy or their caretakers. I think maybe a piece of advice I'd give to anybody currently going through or who has been through it in the past is tell someone tell someone tell somebody it's okay you're not going to be in trouble and even if the first person you tell doesn't react the way you'd hope they would go and tell somebody else because most people will be there and support you and know that it's not your fault and with going to the police just because something happened years ago doesn't mean they can't look into it now they do get a lot of successful convictions I have a lot of goals and dreams despite what I've been through. I think sharing my story on YouTube and other platforms is really important to me. I still believe love is real. I still believe the majority of people are good in this world. I forgive everyone so that I can forgive myself because the only person you're punishing by holding on to all that hatred and anger is yourself. I think my biggest advice is just to keep pushing on. Life's hard, but you're here for a reason and it's so magical and unique that we're even here on this planet and life that we exist and that's a gift and please don't ever underestimate the hole that you will leave if you left early so just keep fighting and searching and trying thank you so much for listening to my story i hope you've got something from it I think please remember you were so worth it and special and loved and amazing and it's life will get better it always does